Africa. Hello and welcome to Focus on Africa with me, Nancy Kachingira. Top on the program today. More than 600 African migrants who've been stranded on a rescue ship on the Mediterranean Sea are heading to Spain after Italy and Malta refused permission to dock. Two members of Uganda's ruling party who were gunned down on Friday have been laid to rest. Also in the program, traveling within Africa. Nigerian Fumi Oyatogun calls herself Africa's most adventurous woman. And now she's produced a map showing the challenges of traveling on the continent. She'll be telling us more. And in sport, as the clock ticks down to the World Cup, African teams begin to arrive ready for the biggest show on earth. Focus on Africa comes to you from BBC World News. Thanks for tuning in. A rescue boat with more than 600 African migrants on board has been told it can dock in Spain after being left in limbo when it was turned away by both Italy and Malta. The migrants on board were picked up in six different rescue operations off the coast of Libya. They include seven pregnant women, 11 young children and 123 unaccompanied minors, according to a journalist on board. Italy's new interior minister refused to let the ship in, having promised in the country's recent general election to take a tougher stance against migration. Spain has said it will take the stranded ship in order to avoid a humanitarian disaster. More than 33,000 migrants have arrived in Europe by sea so far this year, according to the International Organization for Migration, with 785 deaths recorded. That's actually a decrease of 55% compared to the same period last year. The main nationality of arrivals has also changed in this period. Last year, the largest number of arrivals were of Nigerian or Guinean origin, whereas this year, most are Tunisian or Eritrean. We are told that the passengers currently on board the Aquarius rescue boat include migrants from Eritrea, Ghana, Nigeria and Sudan. James Reynolds reports from the Sicilian port of Catania. The Aquarius sailed into the Mediterranean as normal on Saturday in order to save lives. Italian naval officials directed it towards migrants struggling to stay afloat off the coast of Libya. I need more life jackets. Take them off, people, if you must. Let's go. This was not an easy rescue. Hold up. We need to stop outside recovery right now. But in the end, everyone was saved. One by one, guys. One after the other. One after the other. You, in the rough. Go, 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 in the rough. Let's go. The Aquarius then headed north, expecting to dock at a port here in Sicily. But Italy's new government said no. It no longer wants to take in the people it helps to save. Nearby Malta also closed its ports. The rescue ship was suddenly stuck at sea with hundreds of vulnerable passengers on board. We have uh, over 100 children uh, on board and small babies as well. Uh, and uh, multiple women, including uh, seven, uh, seven pregnant women. The situation uh, will become uh, more and more difficult on board. Uh, our capacity is normally 500 people. We're now at 629. The sights of endless waves of migrants making it to Italy angered many in this country. The populists won power by promising to solve the problem. Ten days after taking office, they've won a first victory. The problem has been solved thanks to the generosity of the Spanish government. Clearly the EU can't go on this way. Today is a new beginning. Spain's intervention may solve the crisis on the Aquarius, but what happens when the next set of people sets off towards Italy? James Reynolds, BBC News, Sicily. The Aquarius rescue ship that we've seen there is run by the SOS Mediterranean, a humanitarian organization founded by European citizens to rescue people in the Mediterranean. Jana Kerniak is a spokesperson for that charity and she joins us now. Thank you for talking to us. Can you tell us where the boat is now and what the situation is on board? Yeah, sure. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, well, we're currently still stuck in between Italy and with uh, 629 people on board. 
um, as mentioned, we still have no, we still haven't received any instructions where to head next, where to disembark uh, the 629 people, and uh, therefore we're stuck. So we, we have heard reports, though, uh, that Spain will take these migrants. Are you on course heading for Spain? No, we're still in between uh, Malta and Italy. We haven't received any official information yet that we're supposed to go to Spain. And uh, we're still waiting for instructions from the Italian authority authorities. Uh, those were the ones that coordinated the rescue operations that we had and the transport operations. So they're also the ones supposed to, to give us further instructions where to head next. So have you ever encountered a situation like this before with a rescue boat having nowhere to dock? Well, we have never experienced such a case before. We've been operating continuously without any break now in the central Mediterranean for two and a half years. We've rescued more than 29,000 people and we've never had to face such a situation before. And what do you think you will do now, especially if you do not receive uh, information about where you can dock for some time? We understand there's not much food on board, for instance. How will you manage that? Yeah, I mean, the, the situation is still that we're waiting for instructions from um, from Italy. Uh, this is the normal procedure. They're coordinating all of our rescue operations uh, for the last two and a half years now. And we're still depending on their instructions where to head next. And uh, as you mentioned, um, we still have some supplies, uh, some food on board. But the situation is slightly turning critical at the moment. All right. Thank you very much for speaking to us, Jana who is a spokesperson for the SOS Mediterranean. Well, now let's take a quick look at some of the other stories that are making headlines across Africa. In Ethiopia, thousands have held a protest in Badme, the small town that was the focus of a border war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Last week, Ethiopia agreed to accept a 2002 ruling by a border commission which awarded Badme to Eritrea. The, dem the demonstrators held placards denouncing the government's decision to abide by the ruling. A popular whistleblowing website in Tanzania has been forced to shut down after the government introduced controversial regulations for online content. Known as the Swahili Wikileaks, Jami Forums has millions of followers on social media and Tanzanians used it to share sensitive information, including criticism of the government. Critics see it as a clampdown on freedom of expression. Pro-democracy activists in the Democratic Republic of Congo are calling for an independent investigation into the death of one of their leaders. Luke Nkulula died yesterday in a fire at his home in Goma, which his colleagues say was suspicious. He helped start the pro-democracy pressure group Lucha and was arrested several times by the authorities. Next, a Ugandan MP who was assassinated on Friday has been buried today in Arua, in the north of the country. Ibrahim Abiriga, a staunch ally of President Yori Museveni, was shot dead along with his bodyguard by gunmen on motorbikes on Friday. Angered by the killing, some of the MP's supporters tried to attack Arua's main police station on Sunday. Catherine Bierohanga reports. Ibrahim Abiriga led a colourful life. He started out as a soldier in former President Idi Amin's army, became a rebel and then a vocal ally of President Yoro Museveni in parliament. Mr. Birgo was shot dead together with his brother on Friday. But the younger amongst Mr. Birgo's constituents has shown itself. They say the government failed to protect one of its strongest supporters. On Sunday, they tried to attack a local police station and then destroyed property at the Member of Parliament's home. But security forces quickly stepped in. This is not the first high-profile murder in Uganda recently. A year ago, a senior police officer was attacked as he travelled to work. Over a dozen Muslim clerics have been killed, as well as a state prosecutor. There have also been growing media reports of kidnappings and murders. It's all led to a growing sense of insecurity, which some say raises doubts about President Museveni's legitimacy. The president in the whole of Africa is looked at as one that has been dealing with issues of security at a very complex level. You know, we have deployed in Somalia, uh, Equatorial Guinea, we are there. That is why it is an indictment to the president to ensure that it deals with these matters that are emerging as quickly as possible. The government insists the situation is under control. 
And Mr. Museveni has again promised more surveillance equipment, like security cameras, as well as better forensic capabilities for the police. The president also called for stronger media controls, especially for radio stations and social media. He says this is because they spread hatred. It comes after Parliament passed a tax on social media use in the country. Catherine Biarahanga, BBC News, Kampala. Let's keep talking about that situation. One of Uganda's most prominent opposition leaders, Kiza Besije, is watching the very same situation. He's in the UK at the moment and joins me now. Thank you for talking to us. What is your view on everything that's happening with the security situation in Uganda at the moment? Well, it's extremely concerning and uh, I think it's a result of deep and uh, long-standing problems that are of political and uh, economic, social and economic uh, 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 basis. Uh, first of all, we have a regime that has been in power for more than 32 years uh, that came into office through force of arms, not that Mr. Museveni was initially elected into office, and has stayed in office largely by use of force rather than by consent of people. So there is a lot of frustration, political frustration in the country. Right. In now, fact, if, if just sorry, if we just focus in on, on, on the security situation at the moment, uh, the president has said this particular killing may have been politically motivated. The secretary general of the ruling party has come out to say that uh, to accuse the opposition of fanning uh, negative sentiment towards government officials and to saying that may have played a part. What do you have to say about that? Well, I think it is uh, ridiculous because the insecurity is affecting a whole spectrum of the people in Uganda. There have been a lot of killings of rural people by machete, by iron bars. Nobody has ever been uh, held responsible for those killings. There was killing of a senior police officer who was gunned down in exactly the same way. There have been killings of religious leaders, uh, cleric, uh, Muslim clerics. Uh, we don't know who kills them. There has been killing of a, a, a prominent prosecutor, national prosecutor. Uh, so it is not... Uh, the, the, this particular killing may have been indeed political because last year there was a very contentious change of the constitution in which this particular MP was uh, quite notorious in the, in, that, in, in the process of changing that constitution. The change of the constitution itself was something was, that was an assault on the, on the people of Uganda. Uh, and, uh, and there is a lot of anger, deep-seated anger. Indeed, you may have seen that when uh, the body of, of this MP arrived in his hometown, there broke out spontaneous and widespread, uh, uh, you know, demonstration uh, that was indeed uh, turning violent, uh, the destruction of the uh, tents that had been put up and chairs and so on and so forth. If so I, there, if is, I may there is a lot in. of anger. If I may just cut in, Dr. Bessie, sorry. Um, the president has talked about some of the measures he wants to put in place uh, to curb this insecurity, but what do you think should be done? I think first things first there is need to address the discontent the popular discontent that arises of an unsettled political questions the fact that people have no voice that they are the 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 the, the, the corruption is uh, eating away their livelihood they cannot do anything about it but people will have... that solve security issues in in the short run in the short run you, we still the, the the political questions still have to be solved. One of the underlying problems is the breakdown of the administrative institutions. The grassroots institutions, which are the local councils, have never been elected in the last 17 years. And these are the people that indeed are able to tell what is going on in the local areas, to be in charge of security. The reason they have not been elected is because indeed Mr. Museveni fears that they would be uh, won by the opposition. All right. Thank you very much for talking to us this evening. Dr. Kiza Besije, uh, one of Uganda's prominent opposition leaders.
This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Nancy Kachungira. Still to come, Salim Kikeke will be joining me here with all the sport, including this. South Africa retaining their overall World 7 Series titles after beating England. Each of them would have had families, a life, and this is the only way we can now remember them. Когда врачи предложили и сказали, что если вы не хотите, мы можем сделать один укол этому ребенку и все, ни вы не будете мучиться, ни ребенок не будет мучиться. А кумари кей зачем сажать эти кумари? Сусид, джентльмен, у меня это банально. Our World is a unique series of films on the BBC, offering personal insights into global events. Our World, stories that speak for themselves. Every year, thousands of Pakistani children are sent away to work as domestic servants. Some are abused or even worse, but those responsible are rarely brought to justice. Our World, Pakistan's Child Maids on BBC World News. Hello, I'm Nancy Kachingira. This is the top story this hour. Spain has offered to take in a rescue ship with hundreds of migrants on board. Italy has described the move as a victory for its hardline policy on immigration. But the people in charge of the rescue operation told Focus on Africa that they haven't yet received instructions to go to Spain. Now, while there is a focus today on the story of migrants trying to reach Europe, there are, of course, other aspects to the travel story. Not least, the question of how easy or difficult it is for Africans to go to other countries on the continent. Nigerian Fumi Oyatogun, who calls herself Africa's most adventurous woman, has published a map showing which countries are easy for Nigerians to visit, shown in green, those that are hard, shown in red here, and somewhere in between, shown in orange. And you can see that there are still large parts of the continent that are still quite tricky for Nigerians. Now, Fumi's map has inspired Kenyan traveller Winnie Ryoba to produce another version from a Kenyan perspective. You can see that according to her research, which follows a similar colour scheme, that there are more countries that Kenyans find it easier to go to. But it's still not that straightforward to travel, with places like South Africa proving tricky. Well, Fumi Oyatogun is in Lagos and Winnie Ryoba is in Nairobi joining us tonight. Thank you for talking to us. First of all, I'm curious about the criteria. What criteria did you use to figure out which countries are easier to go to than others? We'll start with you, Fumi. Thanks, Nancy. So we considered the visa requirements for Nigerians as well as the access by air transport. So we tried to figure out which countries have direct flights, which countries have short layovers, and which countries have either no flights that fly directly or long layovers in between flights. And then we also considered which countries have visa-free visa, visa free access for Nigerians or visa on arrival or which countries require a formal visa application process. So those were the, the criteria that we used to figure out which countries were easy and which ones were harder for Nigerians to travel to. And what was the most interesting thing that you discovered for me? I think it was interesting to, to notice that even though all of West Africa is visa-free for Nigerians, not every country is green in West Africa, and that's because uh, we still have poor flight connectivity in the West. And it's, more in it's, it's also interesting to notice that a lot of East Africa was easy for Nigerians to get to compared to some countries in the West or in North Africa. And some countries might have visa-free visa, visa free, uh, access for Nigerians or visa on arrival, but the flight connections are just poor. So that was, that was one of the things that really struck me when uh, producing the map. And from the Kenyan perspective, Winnie, did you find uh, similar things or very different to what Fumi is talking about? Um, okay, 
for me, for the Kenyan, for the, for the Kenyan passports, it's easier for Kenyans to travel to East, most of East and South and African countries, except Mozambique and South Africa. So I discovered that as a Kenyan, you can, because flights in Africa are very expensive, you can easily ac go across all these countries, cross these bo borders by road with no problem because you just easily get in and you're stamped. You just stamped and get in. The other thing that I discovered for West Africa is that some countries are visa-free for Kenyans. But in my research, as we speak, I'm planning a trip to West Africa in the next two weeks. In my research, something came up that crossing the borders in, a, in as much as it's some countries like Benin are visa-free for us as Kenyans, we might be required to pay something to cross. West African borders have a concept called virgin passport. So for you to be able to cross over for the first time, even if you're eligible for a visa, you have to pay something. That was interesting for me because it's easier to cross East Africa and South Africa without paying anything because you're already eligible for visa-free access. This is not the same in West Africa. Well, that was a shocking discovery That's a very me. interesting thing that you're describing there. Fumi, I'm just wondering because the African Union has been talking a lot about uh, getting rid of visa requirements across the continent. Do you think that would help Africans uh, be more aware about the fact that they can visit other African countries before they go further afield? I think so. I think what the AU is trying to do is absolutely amazing. I think it's long overdue. I think that's one of the key factors that would help Africans travel Africa more frequently and travel better than they do right now. So currently, I run TVP Adventures and we organize tours. And we've noticed that majority of our tours across Africa are to some of the countries that offer visa-free access or visa on arrival for Nigerians. But if the AU comes together and has a visa policy that allows Africa to travel the rest of the continent without visas or with visas on arrival, then I think that'd be easier for us. And Winnie, do you think more people may start looking at Lagos or Nairobi as a destination before they think of Paris and London? Uh, to be honest, yes and no. No, because flights, for instance, if I'm booking a flight to Lagos, it's around 40 to 60,000 Kenya shillings. That's around $600. And booking a flight to maybe Thailand, Europe, it's around the same figure or, or, le or m a little bit more. So most Africans would prefer to go to other continents. Right. But yeah, it might work, yeah. It might work. Oh, just one quick question. I have to know, how many countries have each of you been to on the African continent? Fumi? I've only been to eight on the African continent. But okay. um, I, I plan to get to all 54 by the end of next year. Oh, well, good luck with that. What about you, Winnie? <laughs> I, have, I have been to 16 countries, African. Thank and you. And I'm hoping to, fi to finish them before I'm 30. <laughs> Before I get but, to 30. I won't yeah. ask how long that is, but thank you very much to both of you <laughs> for talking to us uh, this Thanks, evening. Nancy. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Well, now it's time for some sport. Sally is in the studio for that. Hi, Nancy. Many thanks. Uh, Egypt's national football team has arrived in Russia ahead of the World Cup due to start on Thursday. The Egyptians arrive five days before their first game against Uruguay. This is Egypt's first appearance at the finals in 28 years. And they wasted no time as they held their first training session in front of around 80,000 fans. Egypt's uh, Group A game is on Friday. Liverpool forward Mohamed Salah, who is instrumental in the Egyptian setup, did not participate in the training, but trained alone and started running for the first time today since his injury. We're back here at a World Cup after 28 years. We're happy to have arrived here and we should enjoy the atmosphere. Now we will enjoy the championship and hope that we have good results. I'm doing well now and everything is fine. Morocco also landed in Russia on Sunday and went straight to their World Cup base in Verozen. Ver uh, Voronez, uh, where they will stay for the duration of the tournament. The North African side secured this qualification when they beat Ivory Coast in a winner-take-all encounter. It was their first qualification to a World Cup in two decades. It has been Hervé Renard's job to mould a team lacking out-and-out -out stars to form a formidable unit. This is a big pleasure for us, for all the people from Morocco. But now we have to make them uh, proud 
about us. So um, I think we are ready for this uh, big event. Now we have to do it like we said. <laughs> A very not there. And South Africa won their second Rugby 7 Series title in a row after coming from behind to beat England 24-14 in the Paris final on Sunday. Defending champions, South Africa needed a win against England in the Cup final of the last tournament of the World Rugby 7 Series to claim the overall title. And the Blitzbox did just that, coming from 14-7 down to win the showpiece event 24-14. What a comeback. And that's the sport, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salim. Now for a reminder of our top story. A rescue boat with more than 600 African migrants on board has been told it can dock in Spain after being left in limbo when it was turned away by both Italy and Malta. The migrants on board were picked up in six different rescue operations off the coast of Libya. That's it for Focus on Africa. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.